We are nearly halfway through the regular season, and it just feels like fantasy managers have more questions than ever. Whether it's trades, injuries, waivers, big things are getting really tense. Welcome into the Pretend GM Fantasy Football Show. It's episode five. We are recording this on Monday, October. Vic, what's today's date? Is it the 17th? 17th of October, it is indeed. The year is is flying by. So we're recording this before Monday Night Football. So if anything crazy happens in Monday Night Football, sorry that we missed it. I am Alfredo Brown. You can follow me on Twitter at the Pretend GM. And this beautiful, handsome, caramel consigliere of mine is Dr. Vignesh Doraswamy. You can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Vig. Vigasaurus, how are you doing today, buddy? Uh, pretty good, man. I can't complain. I had a good day at work. I get to chat with you. Um, I have no idea what to do in fantasy football anymore. But, you know, all in all, things are pretty good. Yeah, it's good that I that I have you on a podcast since you say you don't know what to do in fantasy football. People are really just going to tune That's in for the rest for. <laughs> of this. Also, you haven't asked me how I'm doing, so now I'm bitter. But yeah, I'm I'm doing really bad. I'm really bad. This is gonna be my this is gonna be my Michael Jordan flu game right now. Okay, I am all hopped up on medication. Let's jump into this, Vig. We talked about people having crazy questions. What to do with players, right? And one of the biggest bits of news to come out over the weekend is Cam Akers and the Los Angeles Rams look like they are moving on from Cam Akers, or Cam Akers is moving on from them. One way or the other, there's a breakup happening. So you, as a fantasy football manager, despite, you know, pretending like you don't know what to do with your team, what are you doing with Cam Akers at this point? Are you trading him away, trading for him, trying to maybe get that discount? You holding on to him, cutting him? Like, what what do we even do at this point? All right, I have to start with saying that was a bit of a joke. I'm like six and no in a league with you where I beat you a couple weeks ago. So I know some things I'll say. You had to throw that in. I had to throw it in. I was waiting for it. You know, this is really tough. I think that, you know, Cam Akers value cannot get really any lower than it is at the moment. So if you're trading him, it's really going to be as like a, a sweetener and add on in a, in a deal where someone who has running backs already might, you know, be able to pick him up and he's going to be great. I think you're otherwise sort of obligated to hold cam makers and see what comes of this. You don't want to be the person who reacts too early and then ends up that cam's fine. And he goes to another team and he's like their new RB one. There are teams where he could do that though. I'm still a little unsure if he can, because of his injury. I know we've talked a lot about it. I know there was like, Oh my God, J Rob looks okay. Um, but really, Besides J-Rob having a couple of great runs, overall, nobody, again, has come back from an Achilles and looked great. So I think you got to hold unless you can maybe toss him in as a sweetener and get something great in return, at least for redraft leagues. Yeah, I don't I don't know what to do here, right? Like, I, th- I think you might want to hold, but, you know, even as you're saying that, right, like my position before this episode was just hold Cam Akers. But at this point, I'm just thinking, where else could he actually go where he where he has some value? You said it can't get worse, but can it get better? Like, is there a spot where he goes, where he's going to get volume, where he's going to be running better. And at this point, like, can the Rams even get a trade partner? It's, it's honestly, it almost seems more likely like he's just going to be holding out and this whole thing gets resolved or he just keeps holding out and they just eventually cut him. And, and that's how it goes because I, it's really hard to find any positive light here with cam acres. Honestly, as a fantasy manager, I don't think that he was bringing you that much positivity towards your team. I don't think he's going to bring you that much positivity going forward. I'd rather just cut him and be done with it and not rack my brain over this every week. That, that might be a little uh, a little spicy, but th- that that's how I'm feeling with Cam Akers. By the way, before we get into everything here today, remember, please smash that like button down below. Subscribe to the Football Guys YouTube channel here. If you have any questions for week seven, go ahead and ask them in the comments below and I will get back to each of them personally or I'll make Vig do it because, you know, he's a doctor. He's got a lot of time on his hands. He's pretty lazy. And uh, we also have an audio version of this podcast. If you're not watching on YouTube, you just need to listen and the audio version, man, you can listen to this in your car, at home, wherever. Leave a five star rating and review of the show. Vig, we're about to start everyone's favorite segment of the show, the Rehab Roundup. All right, we're getting ready for the Rehab Roundup. Oh yeah, the voice is still going. This is my flu game, but we're going to make it work. First player we're talking about here, J.K. Dobbins. All right. It sounds like J.K. Dobbins, best we can tell, his knee tightened up, whatever that means. I don't have great medical terminology for it yet because nothing has been released yet. But look, honestly, if you've rostered J.K. Dobbins thus far, you're probably holding on to him. You're going to keep him on the bench. Don't do anything drastic. Look for what the reports say. Follow the injury reports. Um, As we've learned, and we'll talk about for another player coming up, can't always trust the injury reports. But best we can tell, this does not sound like something that's going to keep J.K. Dobbins out for a while. 
J.K. Dobbins, one tough son of a gun, he should be back, according to Dr. Fig. Let's talk about a cowboy here, Dalton Schultz. Yeah, Dalton Schultz, man, has he been a source of frustration? The guy didn't even carry an injury designation, and so you're like hoping he's going to start, and then hours before kickoff, it's all of a sudden, hey, no Dalton Schultz, and that can be so tough. So look, it sounds like he got a PCL sprain. Um, so sprained a ligament, it's an important ligament, but like not the worst thing in the world. Um news from like three hours ago on cbs sports said that it turns out he tweaked something during like practice on saturday that's why they held him out kind of weird that it wasn't on the injury designation in his absence jake ferguson might have even been like the lone bright spot for that cowboys offense and their loss to the eagles all of this to say it is hard to know what to make um this is something that he may re-aggravate again it's really weird so watch the injury reports they're not entirely reliable but if Dalton Schultz was your primary tight end at this point, hopefully you have a backup. But if he was your planned TE1, look at the waiver wire, see what you can find. I'm not saying he's not going to be great. He really could come back with Dak coming back too and be a league winning sort of tight end for you if he reclaims some of his former glory. But at this point, really look for a backup option that you may need to plug and play at the last minute because things are very unclear with Dalton Schultz. The next player we got here is Marquise Hollywood Brown. He's got a foot injury. I mean, talk about talk about bad timing. So um, he's got a foot injury. It sounds like he's got a small fracture, nothing that's going to need surgery or operation. The best news sort of hot off the press is that this might take up to six weeks, uh, possibly as early as four weeks. So um, he will be gone for the time being. He could come back, I think, like around bye week or after their bye week. And the ID hops coming too. We'll talk more about that Cardinal situation. He's getting a second opinion, though. So for now, if you have Marquise Brown, you can't trade him with the injury unless – you, you know, send him out to someone later. You kind of got kind of got to hold him, but do not cut Marquise Brown unless you absolutely have no other choice. Put him on the IR. All right, let's get to our fourth player here. And it's Deion Jackson running back yeah, for the <laughs> Indianapolis Colts. <laughs> Who had Deion Jackson as a possible RB1 last week? Uh, anybody? Anyway, he had a small quad issue. Looks like he'll be back next week. What we really have to monitor is what happens with the rest of that team. But if you have Deion Jackson, hold watch. He may play again. He may be outstanding again. But let's be honest, he's not going to play that putrid Jacksonville defense again. So he may not get you that same value. All right, let's take a look at one of the oldest wide receivers in the league. Randall Corn on the Cobb. <laughs> Poor Randall Cobb. Looks like he's had a high ankle sprain. We know what this does to wide receivers and running backs, folks. Expect him to be out for the time being. He will not play next week and probably not the week after. But watch the injury report. See what happens. I, I feel like I don't want to trust any Green Bay wide receiver. I don't know, Alfredo. You're good at wide receivers. Do you trust any of those guys out there? Okay, so I was going to do the voice, but honestly, my throat is on fire at this point. And I, I, you know what? It's hard. It's hard to really trust any of those Green Bay Packers wide receivers right now. I think Alan Lazard actually still seems to be the guy over there. And he and Romeo Dobbs continue to get, you know, roughly seven, eight, nine targets per game. And they're getting targeted. But I, at this point, I don't know if it matters. Aaron Rodgers just looks so bad. The offensive line has just been struggling with any kind of stunts they get. Aaron Rodgers has just been getting blitzed right up the middle. Uh, that loss of Corey Lindsley, their starting center from last year, has been really tough on them. And this offense just looks so stunted. To see them struggle against the Jets was really surprising. The voice is coming back because we got one more injury. And it's Carson Wentz quarterback for the commanders oh man carson wentz uh, oh, what a what a weird story his fantasy production has been this year but anyway uh he has fractured his ring finger in his throwing hand and this poor guy is out for at least four or five six weeks um if you're in super flex leagues maybe maybe there's like a taylor heineke you can pick up uh, i don't see i don't know i don't see sam Howell being thrown in anytime soon but um but you never know so carson wentz though, is going to be out for a little bit um if you if he was your qb1 in a in a, you know, you were doing a late round QB strategy. Maybe, maybe it's probably it was time a little bit ago, but maybe it's time for you to find somebody else. But overall, um, in a super flex league, maybe it's Taylor Haneke. Yeah, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if we do get a little bit of Sam Howell down the line. If you get two Taylor Heineke losses, at some point, the commanders just do. They have to figure out what they have in Sam Howell, right? And he'll be active for these games with Carson Wentz out. So you never know when this could happen. I actually, I do like him as one of those like speculative ads. All right, Vic, so we're moving on here from the rehab roundup, uh, a fan favorite as always. And let's talk about our waiver ads going into week seven. Vig, you got us on our first one here. Tell us who you're adding going into week seven. 
I want to say I would add him in most leagues, but I already have him. So Alec Pierce, wide receiver for Indianapolis. The guy has really been great. He's the clear wide receiver to Indianapolis, though he's really put up some wide receiver one numbers occasionally for them, uh, for them at least. And he's had three straight games with double digit PPR points. The dude was on the field for more than two thirds of the snaps, which is his season high last week. And the spicy part is they are playing Tennessee, the commanders, and then Patriots in the coming week. So some potentially juicy lineups as it looks like Matt Ryan finally remembered what to do. Yeah. Matt Ryan, he finally, he looked good in that game. I think a lot of it was, um, you know, him being in a dome, Matt Ryan ends up playing a lot better. You know, it's, it's one of those things that it's like one of those weird stats that you see, like the split between dome and outdoors and Matt Ryan's just better when there's no weather conditions. Let's take a look at the second player on this list here. And it is Wandale Robinson wide receiver for the New York giants. Listen, he had his first game back this week and he's being eased in after injury and Daniel Jones loves the slot wide receiver. You can just go look back at all the production Sterling Shepard had every time that he was active, which wasn't often, but when he was, things were good. Now, in his first game back, he had four targets on just 15 snaps. He caught three of those passes, 37 yards, and a touchdown. Up next, he's got Jacksonville, Seattle, and then a bye week. But I would hold on to him through that. This is a player that we have been talking about, whether it's been redraft, dynasty, whatever. Wandale Robinson has been one of the guys to stash early, hold on to, and considering the lack of wide receiver production on that team and the lack of talent around that team, it's just been all Saquon. You could see a lot of Wandale Robinson going forward. Vic, take us to our next player. All right. The next one is Jamison Williams, wide receiver from Detroit. He shouldn't even be on a lot of waiver wires. Look, I'm just going to quickly say this. I don't even care who they're playing next. This is one of the best wide receiver classes we've had in a while with like Burks and Wilson and Olave and London and Dotson and, and Pickens and all these. Folks. Remember that Jamison Williams prior to his injury was the number one wide receiver in this class. I'm not saying he's going to come back and blow everyone out of the water in his first week, but think about your fantasy playoffs. This is truly someone everyone got so hyped up about how Pickens has been doing. This is truly a wide receiver that can win you championships. I have him like in my IR on all sorts of leagues. Um, if he's available, I really, really think that this is like one of the best speculative ads you can make. Yeah, I've actually been pretty aggressive with it. I went out and got Jamison Williams back two weeks ago. I'm in a league that doesn't even allow IR unless a player has COVID. And I have just kept him on that bench. Diamond hands, man. I'm holding strong on the Jamison Williams because coming out of that bye week, I wouldn't be surprised to see him back and going. Dan Campbell has been talking about some positive reviews of his recovery. So I'm excited to see what Jamison Williams can do considering how DJ Chark has been a relative flop over there in Detroit. So uh, we could see a lot of Jamison Williams early and often. Next player I want to take a look at here on the waiver wire is Tua Tonga Bailoa. I have mentioned this name a lot this year. That's because the Dolphins have actually been pretty good on offense. And even now with uh, Skylar Thompson, Teddy Bridgewater, the wide receivers are getting work. Okay. Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle were excellent. The Dolphins defense has still been able to have some fantasy relevance, you know, but they do look different without Tua. They don't look as good. They can't score. And you see how good this team can actually still be putting up points with the third string, seventh round rookie quarterback. They got two easy matchups coming up next with Pittsburgh, Detroit, um, Chicago coming up next is, you know, it seems maybe easy on paper, but to a by Loa being back and active, he probably got dropped in your leagues considering the injury. If he's out there on waiver wires, I would consider him as a streamer for the next three weeks. Vic, take us to our next player. Yeah, I got nothing else to add for Tua, but up next we have Dontrell Hilliard running back for the Tennessee Titans. They're playing the Colts, the Texans, and the Chiefs, and at least two of those seem relatively easy. Now look, because of the bye week, a lot of people may have dropped him, and he is still a top-tier handcuff if you see any issues with Derrick Henry. Around now, last year is when Derrick Henry got hurt. I'm not saying he's going to, but this is a sort of time where you don't want to be caught with like, like elite round one running back or round two running back that you drafted who gets hurt and have no backup plan. If you drafted Derrick Henry, you got him pretty early and you're expecting outstanding production. And I think Hillier gives you that if there's a Derrick Henry injury. Yeah, this is the time of year to have your handcuffs or someone else's handcuffs for that matter. Now, the next player we want to talk about here on the waiver wire is, you know, we're, there's going to be a lot of talk about Arizona and the wide receiver room. It's Rondell Moore. Okay. With the Marquise Brown injury, obviously he's going to be out for six weeks. This is the time for Rondell Moore to step back into the fold. He has an established role in this team. He played 99% of the snaps this past week. He tied for the team league in targets. Uh, l- listen, I-, I know that DeAndre Hopkins is coming back, but Rondell Moore's role is very different from D Hop. 
they, these are not guys that overlap in terms of the offensive scheme. So the things that Rondell Moore is going to be doing, he's going to be getting that ball in small spaces. He's going to be getting that ball close to the line of scrimmage and expected to do a lot of things where he can run after the catch. So you're going to see a lot of yak opportunities for him, and it, it could be better for a, a guy like him in, in a PPR format. Vic, get us to our last player here on the waiver ads. Last player, Nico Collins, wide receiver for the Houston Texans. They're playing Las Vegas, Tennessee, and Philadelphia coming up. Now, you'll see a common theme, and it might be a theme you can look into, but a lot of times players are dropped because of their bye weeks, and they just need space. So look for who your teammates drop. Hopefully you're already doing this, but I find that a lot of people don't, and I've like picked up players that had no business being dropped. But Nico Collins, someone else who could have been dropped because of the bye week, and he's a pretty high upside stash. I know things haven't looked great for him overall, but he's got the talent, and he's just an absolute physical specimen. Texans have a top three easiest schedule for, for wide receivers, and you know that Brandon Cooks is still sort of getting that. Like, if there's a lockdown corner, still goes after Cooks. Nico Collins' snap share has gone up every single game pretty much. Um, he has no touchdowns on the year, so he can't be any worse. So he's like a pretty good speculative ad, I think, who, again, truly potentially may have, you know, playoff winning and league winning upside as the league progresses. All right, we're getting into the meat and potatoes of the show. Who actually just sits there and eats meat and potatoes? That sounds really unappetizing when people say that. I don't even know why I said it. Yeah, I don't know why you said it. I'm a vegetarian. That's a very Caucasian life, thing so. to say. Like, I, I, I felt, it. yeah, I felt very white <laughs> saying that. The meat and potatoes of the show. All right, so let's get into the, the, the oh, whatever, I'll say it again. The meat and potatoes of the show. We're talking about some keep trade cut questions. We asked you guys to send in your questions. You can always do that on Twitter. Myself at the pretend GM at Vig for at Dr. Vig. That sounded confusing. At Dr. Vig is your Twitter handle. <laughs> so let's get to these keep trade cut questions. Vig, first one here. I will read it out. Got to keep trade cut. Two for two skill player trade. Najee Harris seems to be on the way down in a 12 team PPR league. Should I trade Najee and Cortland Sutton? for two players that seem on the way up, Chris Godwin and Travis Etienne. So once again, that's Najee and Sutton for Godwin and Etienne. Now, Vig, I got to say, I, I think this one is close, but I don't know that I see a significant upgrade here. If you have Najee and Cortland Sutton, those are guys that maybe Najee hasn't been performing how you'd like, but I don't know that going out and getting Etienne and Godwin is a huge upgrade here. Where, where do you stand on this? I don't think I'd even make the move. I think I'm about the same. And folks, I know this sounds like just another mailbag episode, and it kind of is. There's some mailbag portions of it. But what we want to do is we want to show you our process and how we think about these things. It's not just that we're going to do this. But if we really think about it, our our question is, does this trade, and it sounds silly, but does this trade make my team better? And I don't really know. You know, Sutton, can, Najee and Sutton, I still think, have total higher upside than Etienne and Godwin. Etienne is still playing with James Robinson and, you know, th that offense, it is hard to trust anyone on any given week because of how things have been going. So I agree with you. I think that when you're looking at a trade, you really want to evaluate, does this truly allow me to either really increase my floor or give me a safe floor with crazy upside? And I don't know that I get that safe floor with the Etienne Godwin side. So I don't know if this is a, a trade I would do. Yeah, I think that with both of those guys, uh, Etienne and Godwin is, you know, to an extent, right? Like, they're kind of in a timeshare at what they do. Whereas Cortland Sutton, yes, I get it. Like Jerry Judy is there, but Cortland Sutton for all intents and purposes is the wide receiver one over in Denver. He maintains that, that long ball potential, that touchdown potential every single game. And there was some worries about Jalen Warren taking over for Najee over in Pittsburgh. And we saw last week that really wasn't the case. Like Najee continues to be the guy. It looks like they're trying to use him in more creative ways. Uh, I believe he mentioned, he said he had a steel plate removed from either his foot or his, or his uh, cleat, uh, whichever that's making it more comfortable for him to run now. So, I mean, he didn't, he didn't, you know, like blow us away this last week, but I still lean towards that Najee Sutton side, just simply because I think the floor is already higher because of the volume that they should get and the ceiling remains higher. So that's, that's a little kind of just like step into our psyche on that of why we are making this call, not just saying, Oh, I would rather do this. All right, let's get to our second one here. Vig, we got a listener asking rest of season value. What is your outlook on Marquise Brown, and Deandre Hopkins for the rest of the season? This was already a question people had before the Marquise Brown injury, but you know, it seems like most people have Hopkins pretty low at wide receiver 36, and that seems low, this uh, viewer asks. So Marquise Brown, DeAndre Hopkins, 
where do you have them ranked throughout the rest of the season? How do you think they affect each other's value going forward? This is not to mention, by the way, Robbie Anderson just mm -hmm. got traded to the Arizona Cardinals. That changes things up a little bit. Yeah, look, Robbie Anderson just got traded, and we know the talent that he has on paper, at least. Rondo Moore, as we talked about earlier, is like really progressing, playing like nearly 100% of the snaps. Marquise Brown is out for a while. He's not coming back till the week 13 bye. And at this point, who knows, you know, with Hopkins coming back, Rondo Moore, Robbie Anderson, like, do they have a need to like immediately throw Brown back in or could they potentially ease him in? We just talked about timeshares earlier, right? I'm not saying that Marquise Brown's role is necessarily in a timeshare, but his role can be duplicated by other players that they have. So especially because of this injury, though, I think it's really this is like really big for D Hop, who we know has all sorts of insane potential. He can be the vertical guy, can really stretch the field. Um, you know, as, as Kyler Murray once said, he said, you know, I just knew Hop was going to be down there, so I threw the ball. That's the kind of stuff you get with D Hop. And so, yeah, I think wide receiver 36 is probably a little on the lower side. I think he's a good wide receiver two at kind of worst, hope you would think, over the next six weeks. Um, so again, if he's available, worth, worth grabbing, uh, D hop, but I, most leagues I've seen, he's already been sort of sequestered away. Yeah. I think that the, a lot of that wide receiver 36 talk was more so when Hollywood Brown was healthy. Right. And a lot of that has changed. Obviously it's been the NFL moves fast. Everything changes in a split second, but I don't know that anyone's looking at Deandre Hopkins as the guy that he used to be, right. He's on the wrong side of 30. Uh, last season, things were already on the way down. He had lowest volume of his career last season, averaging just barely over four receptions per game, which was not him. He was always the guy that was getting a lot of volume. He became very touchdown dependent, eight touchdowns in 10 games. This is not the same DeAndre Hopkins that we've been used to, whether it was in the Houston Texans or even early with the Arizona Cardinals. Now there's all this change, right? Robbie Anderson gets added. They still have AJ Green. I, mean, I, I know I'm just like throwing out random wide receiver names, but these are guys that are probably going to remain involved. And now Greg Dorch probably has to fill out some sort of role with Hollywood Brown going down. And then Marquise Brown comes back. And it's not like this is a very favorable schedule for wide receivers either. I think that that's, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty on par to have him in that low end wide receiver, two high end wide receiver, three range, simply just because of how good wide receivers have been this year. The wide receiver positions at an all time high. Uh, it, it's actually crazy. Just looking at some of the numbers, Vig, that you have three players, all set to be like well on pace over 1800 yards, double digit touchdowns. That's talking about Justin Jefferson, Cooper cup, Stefan Diggs, Tyreek Hill. All four of these guys are set for phenomenal seasons. So the wide receiver position has changed. And I don't know that D hop is, is anywhere close to some of those top 15 guys. Let's get to our third question here. And it's, should I cut bait? How do you avoid the sunken cost fallacy? Across multiple leagues, I have players like Allen Robinson, Chase Edmonds, Elijah Moore. When do I convince myself to just cut these guys? So the three players, Allen Robinson, wide receiver for the Rams, Chase Edmonds, running back for the Dolphins, and Elijah Moore, wide receiver for the Jets. These are all three players that people had very high hopes for. People were drafting them uh, in, in the mid to early rounds of their drafts. And I think there's a lot of fantasy managers out there that are just thinking, I invested so much in these players. I can't let them go. And there is, there's a psychology to football, whether it's a fantasy football too, uh, whether we like it or not. So Vig, what are you doing with these guys? You know, I'm just, and I'm going to go back to the last question a little bit too, with the psychology of football. A lot of folks like picked, like there were people who drafted DeAndre Hopkins, like relatively early in their leagues to kind of just sequester him and hold him away and waste a bench spot all year. And they are really, you know, some of those folks are really hoping for like a top 15 wide receiver production from D hop. And we might not get that right and in general, like you said, with wide receivers, I think a wide receiver that's not doing well, honestly, at this point is either cuttable or like a just throw them on as an add on in, a, in any sort of trade to kind of sweeten the deal a little bit. But honestly, Robinson and more are, are truly players you could cut at this point. There's no point in continuing to hold when there are other players who have outscored them or shown that they've been another, you know, we talked about like Pierce and I'm in leagues where Pierce and Robinson have been like dropped a few times or added and dropped, you know. These are players I would rather target than Allen Robinson and Elijah Moore, folks who are just either on bad offenses or on the wrong side of the age cliff for their particular position. But running back, that's a position I approach differently. You got to think about positional scarcity, right? Like how many good startable running backs do you have? And I'm not saying Chase Edmonds is startable, but if you have the room, he's someone that I could probably hold as a handcuff. But honestly, like Robinson and Moore at this point, just cut your losses, cut them, trade them. 
Um, but I don't see a realm where keeping them makes sense unless you have truly, truly crazy deep benches. Yeah, and it's not even a thing with either of those players where you're saying, okay, if Cooper Cup gets hurt, does Allen Robinson become the guy? Because probably not. I think the Rams just fall into an abyss. And then the Jets, right? Like, how many players actually have to get hurt or or start playing poorly for Elijah Moore to get targets? It's it's the craziest thing. Like, he is probably the most talented player that is being underutilized by his team right up there with DJ Moore and a couple of other guys. But at, at least some of these other players are getting targets. Elijah Moore left Sunday's game with zero receptions. I don't get it. I don't understand it. He even went to Twitter and and said, "I, you know, I, I want, I can't say what I want to say, or else I'm a bad teammate." Well, you kind of said it anyways, Elijah. But uh, you know, like I, with wide receivers, vague, like what you mentioned. You know, people ask this: When do I cut bait with these guys? Is well, first off, with wide receiver, it's easy to see what the volume is, right? Like that is one of the things that pass rates for teams. Are they going to be in a lot of passing situations? Do they have a talented quarterback? What is their team identity? The Jets obviously are moving towards running the ball a lot more. And I think that the simple question becomes is, can I ever start any of these players with confidence, right? Like what is a scenario that I would end up having to start them? Would I need to have five, six unplayable wide receivers on my team to start Elijah Moore? And if that's the case, why is he on your team? He should be off your team. You should be getting someone that has some of that high ceiling potential that's out there in waivers. One of those rookies that has, you know, later in the season potential like Jamison Williams, like an Alec Pierce, you know, some of those guys that we mentioned off the waiver wires, Wandale Robinson. I would take Wandale Robinson at this point over Elijah Moore simply because that offense for the, for the Giants looks better when it comes to passing the ball. And there seems to be a target volume there. So I, I, listen, I think that when it comes to this, you just have to ask yourself, can I start them? And if not, where is their higher upside? And if it's on the waivers, go and make your move. Let's get to our next question here. They were looking at swapping a running back for a wide receiver. So we're kind of staying the same theme here. That's a 14 team PPR league. I have Saquon Barkley, Damian Pierce, Miles Sanders, and Ramondre Stevenson. Nice job with the hero RB. Uh, should I trade Jeff Wilson for Drake London? All right. So Jeff Wilson for Drake London. Jeff Wilson coming off of probably his worst game of the season this last week. And Drake London has not been, you know, super impressive over the last couple of weeks. I think a lot of that just has to do with the Atlanta Falcons offense in general, kind of just not really supplying London with all the targets he should be getting. But Vig, what are you doing in a situation like this where you feel like you're kind of loaded at running back? You can go out and get a wide receiver. Let's let's kind of talk in generality, right? So we have an idea of what we're you know swapping here. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this specific example. So what are you doing? So I think big picture, the usual idea is that I do not want to trade an RB1 for a wide receiver because there's so much wide receiver value out there, right? Like in Jeff Wilson, kind of the RB1 for his squad. But... In this particular scenario, this is why you got to look at things case by case basis. You have Saquon Barkley and Damian Pierce and Miles Sanders and Ramondre Stevenson. How you got that in a 14 team league, I don't know, but good for you. It's a good squad of running backs. And if you have Jeff Wilson on top of that, then your next question is okay, if my wide receivers really struggle or really suck, then maybe let's see what I can get for Jeff Wilson. Um, but is trading someone after one of their worst weeks a good idea? Probably not. Like if I do have Jeff, if I have Jeff Wilson, I I, I like your your strategy. Whoever sent us that question, I would be trying to trade him. But is this the best week? This might be a pretty bad week. If the you know if I think about it again, we're talking about the psychology of fantasy football. Um, but against Kansas City next week, you know after that maybe a bit more of a high it might be a good time to make this trade. What do you think? Yeah, the, you mentioned the psychology of fantasy football, and there, there's a big thing, right? Like, one, when someone's looking at, at your roster, and you're talking about a potential trade, and they look at your roster and they see, oh, Jeff Wilson's on your bench. They're like, oh, you're just sending me one of your bench guys. If you put him probably in like one of your starting running back spots, they're like, oh, okay, he's giving me a starter. But then they'll also look at, you know, everyone does this, right? Well, they'll look at the game logs and see the previous games. Oh, Jeff Wilson was really bad this last week. No, nah, man, he's on the way down versus had he gotten even just five carries and ended up with two touchdowns. We're talking about a player that all of a sudden that fantasy manager is really into, right? So there absolutely is a psychology to this. And I think that more big picture, right? I am always of the mindset that I would love to trade a, a running back for my team, right? Like an RB2, RB3, whatever they are, for a wide receiver to a wide receiver three. Just because simply wide receivers tend to score more points. Running backs have a higher volatility in terms of health. And in this case, You've got a 49ers team that's going to have a top three most difficult schedule remaining for fantasy running backs. Jeff Wilson, who 
is already kind of losing snaps. It's Evan Coleman, potentially Tyrion Davis Price. And that's not even to mention Elijah Mitchell coming back, who was a starting running back last year. So, man, I think that honestly, the time to get rid of Jeff Mitchell, uh, excuse me, Jeff Wilson was like last week. Um, it's now it's as soon as you can. Uh, but I do, I do like the idea of see how things go in that Kansas city game. And honestly, it's, you're running a risk there, right? If he has two low games, you're probably not gonna be able to sell him for anything. Uh, but I do think that kind of waiting that extra week, seeing how it goes, then you can kind of make your move. If you can make it now, go for it, man. That that's, that that's the move to make. All right, let's get to our fifth question here. And Vig, we're talking about some stashes. So players to stash, who are your favorite players to stash for the rest of the season? I've lost a few players to season ending injuries, and I'm looking to add some high upside guys. Yes, this is our kind of question. This is what we've been talking about, getting the high upside players, because this is what you need to do. This is that time of the season where you're trying to make that run. And this is where, you know, years and years ago, adding a rookie wide receiver named Odell Beckham changed the, the course of fantasy football for a lot of managers, right? Uh, getting a rookie Le'Veon Bell who hadn't done much for his team. It changed everything for fantasy managers. So Vig, who are some of your favorite high upside players to stash? Yeah, they're like practically all rookies. And we talked about some of these folks with our waiver wire ads, but again, uh, Wandale Robinson, Alec Pierce, Rondale Moore, Jamison Williams. I, these are my four. I cannot believe there's a league where all four of them are on my waiver wire. Now, to be honest, it's like a four wow. bench league. So it's really tough. And it's made, we have a small bench on purpose, but if you play in one of those leagues where you have these like tiny benches that are meant to make you make oh, hate decisions, tiny like, benches, um, this, you know, th these are the kind of players that are still available. Take a look again, truly league winning upside. If you're on like a keeper league where you can, anyone you grab counts as like a late, you know, their keeper cost is very low. These are fantastic players that if they're still available, really worth grabbing. Yeah. I mean, at this point, like, the waiver wire is starting to get a little bare, right? There's not much left, but there are still guys that give you that the high upside. The, the players that you mentioned, I think are some of the smash players to add off the waiver wire that have really high potential going forward for the rest of the season. Then there's some players, you know, maybe in some deeper leagues, guys that your entire league is just forgotten about. Maybe players that have been injured. So Sky Moore is one of those. His snap percentage is going up as the season has progressed. And Kansas City really hasn't had anyone take over the wide receiver room. Juju Smith-Schuster had a good game this past week, but I believe it was just off of five receptions. And one of them was kind of like a fluke, weird thing on a hitch route where he broke a couple tackles and uh, defenders just kind of bounced off him and he ran to the end zone. So it's not like they have a consistent playmaker in the wide receiver room there. So we see that rookies tend to do better, obviously, as the season goes on. They get more, you know, they get used to the game plan. They get used to the speed of the game. And Sky Moore is one of those guys. Kansas City is going to remain in games as the season goes on. So he's one of those guys that uh, I would like to stash. They have a bye in week eight. And I think that after that, they have a string of four really good games where you could see Sky Moore all of a sudden start to take off. Another wide receiver, rookie wide receiver. All these players are rookies. Uh, Khalil Shakir. Khalil Shakir is a wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. He, listen, he filled in when Isaiah McKenzie was out. Jamison Crowder's done for the season. And listen, he didn't do much this last weekend, but the week before that, three catches, 75 yards and a touchdown. And he's starting to take away snaps from Isaiah McKenzie, who for most of his career has been a gadget guy, a return guy. And McKenzie's been kind of underwhelming. I would not be surprised. And I loved Khalil Shakir coming out of Boise State. Uh, he's got, he's got great hands. He's a great route runner. I would not be surprised to see him slowly, but surely take over that slot role for the Buffalo bills. And the good thing is that he's got flexibility to play outside. So if we do experience any kind of Stefan Diggs or Gabriel Davis injury, Khalil Shakir becomes one of those guys that is just a, a really good, he's almost like the, the Josh Palmer of, of Buffalo, right? Like that's what he can be. Yeah. He's kind of that, that wide receiver three. And then I'll, I'll do these last couple guys really quick here is Kyron Williams running back for the Rams, obviously with the whole situation with Cam Akers. And this is for, for deep, deep leagues, right? Um, he's going to have a role on passing downs. He's a good pass blocking back. He's not a real speedster and he's not overly impressive running the football. But if Cam Akers is gone, he will have some sort of role for this team. And uh, Sam Howell, Sam Howell is a guy I mentioned earlier. And this is maybe like deep super flex leagues, right? And I mentioned this a couple weeks ago and even just watching Carson Wentz, man, he was not good. He was not good this past week on Thursday night football. And I feel like no one's good on Thursday night football anymore, but Sam Howell, like I mentioned, if Taylor Heineke loses two games, the commanders have to see what they have with Howell, and he could be able to get into these games. He might not be, you know, incredible, but he gives you a rushing upside. He loves to throw that deep ball. He was teammates with Diami Brown back at North Carolina. We could see something here. Carson Wentz being out, you know, potentially six weeks with a fractured finger on his throwing hand. So, you know, we, we could see some Sam Howell. Big, let's get to our last question here. 
and this one's fun. We got another player for player swap. Talking about positions here. Swapping a wide receiver for a running back. 12 team PPR league, and I need a running back. Exclamation point. Would you trade AJ Brown for Joe Mixon? Question mark. I already have Justin Jefferson, Chris Godwin, Michael Thomas, Brandon Ayuk at the wide receiver position. At running back, I only have Leonard Fournette, David Montgomery, and Antonio Gibson. Things are looking a little scarce for this viewer, audience member, listener, whatever we want to call it, at the running back position. So Vic, we've talked about this a couple of times that we prefer the value of wide receivers over that, you know, secondary tier th- or even third tier of running backs. So a player like AJ Brown th- in this specific trade, right? Because we've talked about like the, the-, the I guess the-, the theology of it, right? But in this theory, specific yeah. theory, sure. Yeah, not theology. I'm I'm not smart like you. Okay, Vig. I'm on a lot of medication right now. Um when it comes to a player like AJ Brown for specifically this example here, Joe Mixon, what what are you doing? This is a really, really good question. I think the the premise here, right? Like the person asking the question is thinking, I have a great wide receiver room, right? I have AJ Brown and Justin Jefferson and Chris Godwin and Michael Thomas and Brandon Ayuk. And I think in theory, a lot of these names sound fantastic, but who are they, who are they actually? Who are they actually playing as, right? Like, can you consistently start any of these players outside of like Justin Jefferson and AJ Brown on a weekly basis? Like we talked about Godwin earlier, possibly you can, but there, there's a lot of like a lot of targets to go around on that offense. And and Godwin is great. This is not denying his talent, but can I consistently say that he's going to do really well? So I don't know. I don't know that this wide receiver room is as strong as you think. And I know Mixon, you know, this is probably may, maybe getting Mixon at one of his lowest points. Um, but if, you know, you have Fournette Montgomery Gibson, RB2 is often the one of the easier roles to fill. And we talked about this earlier, Alfredo, where a wide receiver two will give you, or three even sometimes, or four even, which you put in your flex spot, still gets you more points than your RB2 sometimes, depending on the makeup of your league. So if, you know, if AJ Brown is what they're asking for, I think that's a bit of a steep ask. I don't know that this wide receiver room is that strong. And I don't know that I make this trade. I think I would find something else to package. I think there's some other like permutations we can look at here. Yeah, but good word permutations. So you were man, 36 minutes into the podcast and you're saying permutations. Wow. Anyone that's still listening, they're gone now. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, to, to, to go off of you know what you're talking about here with the running back to replacement thing, right? Like just look back to these these past weeks, right? Where we see Ken Walker all of a sudden become the starter. We see Eno Benjamin become the starter, Daryl Henderson becomes the starter. All these players that start to just Deion Jackson becomes a starter. Like all these players that just start to come out of nowhere. This happens. Brian Robinson, another one. Like names just keep popping up. This happens with the running back position. If you go and even just look at the rankings, Khalil Herbert, there we go. I'm just now I just have word vomit at this point. It, it, the running backs, it, it just continues to show, right? RB2, RB3, they become really easily replaceable. Joe Mixon has been bad, like bad, bad. And the Bengals offensive line has been bad, bad. And this team is showing that they're really not good enough to be leading in games all that often. They have to get back to passing the ball a little bit more. And Joe Mixon has been really propped up by volume, missed touchdown opportunities. And at this point, man, I think that AJ Brown, even though I was a little bit lower on him going into the season, and I still don't necessarily think that AJ Brown's a top five, top six, top eight wide receiver, like people were planning, but he's still a top 12 wide receiver. And I don't even think that Joe Mixon at this point is a top 12 running back. So, when you're talking about having a wide receiver one versus an RB two. Yeah. I'm keeping the wide receiver one there. What I think you could do on a team like this is you could package a player like a Michael Thomas, who people still have a high value of him, despite the injuries, despite the age, despite the, you know, the, the, the coming up of Chris Olave, I'd be looking to package a guy like a Michael Thomas and maybe a David Montgomery, who we don't know what's going to happen there with Khalil Herbert, who keeps showing that he is better than David Montgomery. But I'd try to package one of those guys for a mix in and see what you can do there, right? Trading a, an RB2 and a wide receiver three for a, a high end RB2 or a low end RB1, whatever you want to call mix in, that makes a little bit more sense. And I'm fine, quote, losing on the value there of trading more than what I should to get one good player and kind of save myself the headaches. Uh, some other guys you can maybe even think of, like maybe not direct trade, but guys like Cordero Patterson who could be coming back, Travis Etienne who's on the way up. Like there, there are running backs out there that you can go and get. Vig, that is it for us, man. We did it. I made it through. Um, I'm probably going to pass out immediately after this. My throat is killing me, but that's it for us. We made it, man. 39 minutes. We did it. Yeah, so don't forget, 
yeah, it, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. So don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, please smash that like and subscribe button. Subscribe to the Football Guys YouTube channel. Leave a comment if you have any questions about week seven, and I will get back to you personally. Or like I mentioned, Big will do it because he's a doctor. He's got a lot of time on his hands. He's really not doing anything every day anyways. And then also, we have the audio version of the show. You can listen to it wherever you'd like. Please leave a five-star rating and review. For myself, for my Caramel Consigliere, Dr. Vignesh Doraswamy, thank you so much for listening. Adios.